Welcome to the session. Session will be about architecting an analytical data platform. The idea is that you leave the session with an understanding on what could be a data platform that you envision, that you build and that you deploy in Oracle or with Oracle technology. My name is Jose Cruz. I'm an analytical data platform like our specialist leader, and I will be delivering the session today for you. So in terms of the agenda, what we'll be covering is for one, we'll be giving you an overview of what is a data platform, what are the components and what are the capabilities. Next, we'll basically uh, discuss a bit about the workloads. What are the types of workloads that that data platform supports? What is the architecture? What is the logical and deployment architecture beyond behind the, a data platform? And how can you basically uh, do your architecture and what are the design options that you can take? What are the best practices in doing that architecture that basically allow you to attract more value of data and uh, producing business outcomes that could influence your business? And then later on, uh, giving you uh, some examples, uh, workloads of real life uh, customers that leverage the Oracle Data Platform to produce business outcomes and be data driven. So, the data platform, a complete modular open and integrated data platform. Complete in the sense that we have a set of services that are complete that you could use to explore any data. Modular in the sense that you could use any combination of services. You do not need to use them all, you just use it as needed. Open because you can run obviously open source inside the Oracle Data Platform, but it is also open interoperable leveraging standards with other technologies, with third-party technologies that you might run in OCI, other clouds or on-prem. Obviously integrated in the sense that these services are modular, but they are pre-integrated in, them, in themselves so that you can basically get up to speed with your Oracle Data Platform. So normally we ingest data from different data sources and you can think of you can ingest any type of data from any type of source, whether that's basically a SaaS application, an on-prem application, databases, files, telemetry coming from devices, or for instance, uh, social media videos and images. Once you do that, you basically start processing the data, storing the data on the different uh, storage layers. The idea here that you store uh, the data depending on the data set, depending on the use case or the most efficient storage layer for that particular data. And then you can use the data for different purposes, for machine learning and AI, for visualizing or producing visualizations that your end users can consume, or doing low-code application development, typically mixing transactional data with, opera, with uh, OLAP data as well, so that you have embed intelligence into your applications when the users are transacting with your application. And all of this, typically would be, uh, would be done to basically produce business outcomes, whether that's uh, increasing the, the business, growing the business, creating resilience in the business, or whether that's optimizing the business as well, and eventually reducing costs by through that optimization. Keep in mind that you can deploy the data platform not only on public cloud, on the 40 plus regions that uh, Oracle has, we typically have uh, we typically have a roadmap where you continuously launch regions and services, etc., at a good cadence. So uh, keep uh, keep an eye on that. But obviously, the world started also to see that multi-cloud is something that uh, that is top of mind uh, with a lot of companies. That is something that is natural, and you could run your um, workloads, your data platform uh, workloads across multi-clouds as well. So having a portion on OCI, having a portion on other clouds, and vice versa. If by any means your company also has specific uh, requirements in terms of data sovereignty or data privacy or some requirements that are imposed by a regulator, you could also leverage sovereign cloud or dedicated cloud. Think of it as typically dedicated cloud, almost like a private cloud that has all the OCI features for your, uh, for your company or a sovereign cloud, typically cloud that is run in country with persons and with personnel that is uh, basically running it from in-country. You can also run it hybrid. Imagine extending your on-prem capabilities with uh, cloud capabilities. Imagine that you have a large data warehouse that you're still not ready to move from on-prem, but you want to create ML and AI sandboxes. You want to basically start sharing data. You want to create a demotrized zone for sharing data in cloud. You could do that with a notion of hybrid cloud. And obviously you could also extend your capabilities on-prem. So a data platform, in terms of overview, it's part of a wider cloud infrastructure platform, right? Basically OCI uh, has a bunch of services. 
and services for different areas, not only the data platform, and the data platform sits within all of this ecosystem. Because of it, it can be deployed across different deployment models, as we've seen, from public to hybrid to multi-cloud. It is interoperable because it leverages standards, so we can interoperate and we can interconnect with third-party clouds, with uh, on-premises, and that interconnection is not only at network level, but also at services level. So, for instance, you can read, imagine a Kafka cluster that is on a third-party cloud to bring in data to the data platform or serve via API, uh, an ML inferencing that can be consumed from an on-prem application. The integration between the services, obviously, is seamlessly. Uh, obviously, the idea here that is that since we also have our data centers running Oracle SaaS, it is quite, quite easy and very efficient and very secure to get that data from, for instance, uh, ERP, supply chain, and create analytical workloads that you know, not only mix enterprise data coming from SaaS, but also other data sets that you might have coming from, instance, from devices. Implicitly, on the data platform, we leverage all the OCI capabilities from a security standpoint of view, from observability and management, etc. So, the highly secure, highly performance infrastructure in terms of OCI is basically creating an advantage uh, for the services, for the data platform services that implicitly use them. Since the idea here is that uh, we don't want, obviously want to, we want to be quite open, transparent, and flexible. Imagine if you buy either skill set or if you prefer to use a different set of technology, you could extend the data platform in OCI with other technologies, for instance, leveraging the OCI marketplace. Case in point, for instance, you could run your Informatica workloads alongside a data platform, a lake house architecture in, in OCI. And obviously, if you want to bring in other technology that we might not support uh, in, in OCI, you can deploy that alongside the platform leveraging infrastructure as a service. So in terms of capabilities, very quickly, from left to right, we have a, a set of capabilities for connecting the data, connecting to the data sources, ingesting the data, whether that's in bulk, whether it's batch, micro batch, change data capture or streaming, when to ingest the data and start transforming, augmenting the data, validating the data, you curate that data and do further processing to augment the data from moving from raw data to information. Typically that's done with several engines, could be done via Spark, by Hadoop, via Flink, via a data warehouse, leveraging SQL or PL SQL. And the idea here is that once you store the data, you can process that data with any type of engine. Idea is that you store the data on the persist curate and create layer, and then you can use that data for different purposes. You can offer your consumers that data or there's insights via data products via data sharing, by APIs, via visualizations that users can consume and they can further extend with software capabilities or eventually using ML and AI services. The data platform in that sense is inclusive of all data types. You can ingest any data type into the data platform, whether that's relational, document, spatial, time series, anything you think of in terms of data type, you'll be able to ingest it, right? And you'll be able to do so in an agile way. So. Typically, our multimodal data warehouse can quite easily adopt and uh, ingest data from documents, from relational. But imagine that you also want to ingest video streams or images, you'll be able to do that on cloud storage. We have a wide range of processing engines so that you could basically match your processing according to your needs. So you could leverage Spark, you could leverage the data warehouse to process data. Uh, you could also leverage, for instance, Flink, or if you have a legacy Hadoop workload that you want to bring in and eventually use MapReduce or other uh, processing engines on the Hadoop ecosystem, you can also do that. In that way, we are flexible and modular. Several services, you just use as needed. You don't need to obviously use all the services and it's modular because of that, right? You just use what you need, although they are interoperable with each other and pre-integrated with each other. Since we interact also with the, and are open in the sense that we leverage standards and open standards to interoperate with other clouds, with basically the uh, on-prem, you can create a data platform that is central to your ecosystem, getting data from your existing system, serving data to your existing uh, consumers without any issues in terms of creating silos. Because of this, you'll be able to get faster innovation. It's quite easy to experiment, to spin up services, to start engaging with uh, local DTL tools, for instance, 
start doing low code development, low code BI, etc. So very, very easy to get innovation up front. And since this is an enterprise grade data platform, very highly available and resilient. So all the services are highly available. We publish SLAs to guarantee that. And obviously that means that you can run your data platform at scale, very resilient and without the issues of having uh, major downtime events that impact your users and your business. Since it's scalable and elastic and obviously you can leverage because of that cloud economics, all the services are pretty much able to scale up, scale down, scale out, scale in, depending on the service. You could do that scalability via REST APIs, via SDKs, via common line, or in several services, you could also automate that, leveraging auto scaling policies. Since we are secure by design, and that also uh, is one of the key tenets of OCI, a zero trust approach security, which is which means that all the data that we have on OCI, on the data platform is fully encrypted. You can manage your keys or we can manage for you, but there is no option to have data that is not encrypted on the Oracle Cloud, on the data platform. That makes it quite secure. We also secure it in transit so that you basically have the ability to be compliant with regulation, to be compliant with your security policies so that you can then create trustable information and that you can govern that information from not only from a security standpoint of view, but also from a governance perspective. So in that sense, very cost efficient, very scalable, adjust to what you really use, just use as needed the services. Since the services continuously adopt new features, we also continuously releasing new services and new technology. It does not, it does not only it adapts to the current needs, but it also allows you to grow in the future of your data platform in terms of capabilities. And obviously, since we are, um, all of this is automated, you can basically deploy it with, for instance, Terraform stacks. It is very easy to self-serve the data infrastructure. It is very easy to self-serve data to your users, right? For instance, self-service BI, and hence it's quite easy to democratize data and embed intelligence into your applications. In terms of workloads, we can basically support a plethora of workloads from the full-fledged lake house. Imagine a lake house where you basically are storing all types of data or using a large set of processing engines. Uh, this typically is uh, common on large scale data platforms. So imagine you might have uh, a data warehouse, a lake, and you might want to process depending on the use case with Flink, with Spark, with the Duke, because you brought in a legacy workload that you had leveraging uh, MapReduce, for instance, and you could do all of that in OCI Data Platform. Like our serverless, basically a variant of this, imagine that you do not have a legacy workload that you do not need or that you want to re-engineer a legacy workload into a more modern architecture. Typically, we uh, advise in going with a lake house on a serverless uh, fashion, which means that you're using mostly serverless services and reducing the burden of maintaining the platform of operating the platform and basically also achieving probably better cloud economics because those services typically use basically pay per use for those services. Modern data house, obviously a subset of the lake house. We can support that. We typically have, do that with a cloud data house that is multimodal where you can basically ingest typically uh, uh, any type of data that you can, you can think of uh, in terms of semi-structured data or relational data, spatial graph, etc. Data lakes, you might want to create a data lake in, in, in cloud. You might want to move typically with use cases to do data lakes in cloud, just exclusive data lakes is basically to move existing data lakes that were done, for instance, in Apache Hadoop elsewhere, on-prem namely, and you modernize it to cloud. Typically, a lot of companies, when they do that move, they also move it to a lake house architecture because it gives them and offers them more flexibility in exploring other data and securing the data with granular security and typically the data lake does not offer. You could use it for also artificial intelligence workloads, creating sandboxes for your data scientists to do, to create their uh, ML models, to train their ML models, to do ML deployment. And you might also want to have a lake house that is hybrid in the sense that you might have a lake house that traverses more than one cloud or eventually also connects to on-prem. Needless to say that all of this is flexible enough to adopt new patterns, new architecture patterns, such as data mesh, data sharing, 
or data ecosystems. In terms of architecture, we basically have a set of services. I will not describe all of them in detail. So I do have a link to the data platform, data lake house reference architecture in the Oracle Architecture Center. Please check that because those services are described in more detail. But keep in mind that from a data source perspective, we can ingest pretty much all data sources, right? From application databases, files, uh, telemetry coming out of devices, social media, video, images, etc. Once we land that data and we ingest that data via different mechanisms, whether that's batch ingest, uh, leveraging uh, typically micro batch, advisably to, to, to you know, leverage micro batch to spread out the load across the day, not only having one single batch during the uh, daily batch in, in a sense overnight. You could also do it uh, with CDC. Imagine you have a set of data that you want to continuously stream and trickle feed from your databases. Uh, you might use uh, real time ingest with Coben Gate and basically read data from your databases and produce near real time KPIs with that data. You might want to ingest data in bulk, move data in files, for instance, or uh, at scale. So there is a lot of mechanisms to do that, whether that's with dedicated connectivity, whether that's with transfer appliances or storage gateways. Streaming data, typically you will stream that via queuing mechanism, Kafka compliance streaming service, where you basically can ingest data in a near real time coming from your devices. Once you store that data and typically ingesting the data also means a little bit of transformation in the sense that you already uh, go through a, ser a series of quality steps, doing a little bit of uh, data wrangling, making sure the data is fit for use. Then you start doing uh, processing at scale after storage of the data on the data house or on the lake. And basically then you start creating information out of that data moving from a raw data to curated data and eventually aggregating that data to create data process that you want to serve to your users. And this is curate and uh, create layer. You're, you're actually doing that, right? You're basically moving and creating information and data products out of your data, out of your raw, raw data. And it's basically a cumulative and snowball effect, which is once you augment your data, you can use that augmented data to create additional augmented data sets. The idea here is that once you have that data exposed, which is typically governed by a data catalog, so you want to know where are your data sets, where are they coming from, which data sources were uh, used to get those data sets, etc. So the data catalog basically has a mechanism to harvest the metadata from sources, from where you store the data, so that you have a technical catalog that catalogs all your data assets, but it also pairs it with functionality that you can have a business close area maintained by your business users and where you can link the business close area to the technical terms. So for instance, that your users might want to understand where do I have my um, my customer data? Which data stores do have customer data or do store customer data? And if we navigate from the close area into the technical data catalog, you will be able to discover that. Once you basically govern that data, created the data products, created the data sets that you want to expose, you want to serve that to your business, whether those are to end users, whether that's by applications or eventually to devices. The way to do that is basically you start moving that data or serving that data through analytics cloud, for instance. Analytics cloud can be used as an augmented analytic tool for by users to consume nice, beautiful dashboards with all the information that they, that they need, highly interactive, highly flexible in the sense that they can also mash up user data, so self-service capability as well, and eventually also exposing intelligence that, for instance, you might derive from your data science projects. So imagine you have a set of data scientists that want to build and train and build ML models. They basically deploy those ML models as uh, APIs, and those APIs and that intelligence can be embedded, one, in analytics cloud, in dashboards, but also it can be consumed via APIs from applications, for instance. AI and ML can be done either with a, a code-centric approach or low-code approach where your data scientists are doing their ML models, but you could also leverage pre-built AI services where you can consume services that were already with models, with ML models that were already pre-built by Oracle so that you could speed up your adoption of AI. Obviously, once you do the streaming processing, you also want to push that data as fast as possible to consumers. Those typically are done leveraging 
uh, streaming and stream analytics, which is basically a component that allows you to do low code uh, real time pipelines where you basically can detect on sliding windows patterns of interest, run ML inferencing in real time, having dashboards in real time of what is happening on the streams. And then you should detect, for instance, a pattern. You imagine you detected that the device is going to potentially fail in the next uh, hour or so. You can then create an event, create a, a message, a payload that you put in streaming so that a thing, a device or an application can react to that event. So in terms of deployment view, how can you deploy this? So this is just an example of a subset of a lake house. Typically there will be eventually for a large data platforms, eventually a little bit more based in terms of diagram, but this is a very good example in the way that we have basically data that is ingested security using micro batch streaming our APIs. So in this case, we have basically enterprise applications where we get data from micro batch using a micro batch approach using OCI data integration. Basically, OCI data integration, a low code ET ELT tool that gets data, processes data, and basically ingests data into the lake or into the data house. You can also consume data via APIs, for instance, from SaaS applications, getting REST via data via REST APIs and doing data pipelining with that data and eventually also from databases. So the idea here is that we're using OCI data integration as a way to acquire data, which is then processed also within OCI data integration or local ETL tool. But imagine you might have already pre-built data flow Spark codes that you run in, that you want to run in Spark, in Spark jobs. So hence you can basically start calling that from OCI data integration and leverage your existing Spark skills. Once basically you process that data, you store that data on this case in ADW and object storage, right? And the idea here is that in ADW and in other object storage, you typically organize it by layers. So imagine here we are describing a medallion architecture from bronze to silver to gold. The idea is that you're mimicking that not only on the lake, but also on the autonomous data house, typically using different schemas. And the idea here is that the more you move data from bronze to silver to gold, the more uh, information you're generating. Think of it as bronze is raw data, silver already curated data, already um, denormalized data, already probably with uh, a dimensional model defined, but still at granular level. And then gold is aggregations that you created, different data sets that you start creating with the silver data that you keep creating out of that silver data. Typically, customers' applications are more interested in consuming gold data, eventually also silver. Bronze is just almost a, a way to pass through information through those layers. So imagine you already have that data curated. We move the data and we start transforming the data to get data into the gold layer. And now we need to serve that data. So ADW can serve that data and basically can serve in virtualized data from the, from actually the, the data house itself, but also the, the lake itself. And basically with a single query, deliver results of data stored on both storages. So this is a powerful mechanism in the way that having this, you're not creating silos, right? You basically are able to choose the best storage mechanism, process it with different engines, but still consume it seamlessly with a single query that you can expose to any SQL compliant customer. So imagine OEC, OEC in that sense, on this case, we have a private OEC instance, which is uh, not shown in on this diagram, but is basically front faced by a load balancer for increased security. And that OEC reads data from autonomous data house. That data basically can come from internal tables in the data house, but also external tables or hybrid partition tables, which are tables that have partitions in ADW and in uh, cloud storage, in object storage. Basically, OEC consumes that data. So making it easier for OEC to join data implicitly and without having the need to worry about it. Now imagine you might have a set of data scientists that want to start experimenting with data science. They want to build and train ML models. Data science is a fully managed service that exposes you to an environment leveraging Jupyter Notebook. You could use any Anaconda uh, environment there for free. Imagine you start doing your projects, you build your model, uh, you can leverage 
CPU, GPU infrastructure for that, highly scalable, they produce. Now imagine you train your model and you want to deploy your model. Basically what you can do is you can do deploy your model uh, to a fully managed infrastructure, we call CI data science model deployment, which is deployed on the Oracle services network where basically Oracle manages that infrastructure for you, but still you basically get an HTTP endpoint for where you can call and which you can uh, use to call inferencing leveraging that model that was deployed. Typically, you want to expose that model or any API for that matter via an API gateway. Reason being is that you want to secure that, you want to enforce authentication, eventually you want to create thresholds in order to basically make sure that you do not exhaust the infrastructure that is underlying, for instance, the OCI, OCI data science model deployment. API Gateway has also a nice feature, for instance, to uh, create usage plans. So you can basically dis uh, distinguish different consumers based on their usage, track that usage, and that could be a basis for data monetization in the future. On this case, the data catalog, which is basically a fully uh, managed service that resides technically on the Oracle Services Network, harvests data from the lake, from the different layers, from bronze, silver, gold, but also harvests data from the autonomous data house, and then can expose that technical metadata and uses also and that technical metadata to create a hive metastore, which is then read by the different processing engines. So for instance, Autonomous Zero House reads from the OCI Data Catalog Hive Metastore, get semantics of the tables that are stored on the lake. The data flow or the OCI data integration also reads data from the data catalog to understand what are the semantics of the data assets that they are working on. Data safe from this case, we have not discussed this, but data safe here basically is a service that protects the database in a sense that basically introspects the cloud data house, the autonomous data house in, in, in this regard, to make sure that you have a, a security posture that is good, to make sure that you do not have data breaches and also to, pro to provide activity auditing on uh, activity that was done on the, uh, the, on the data house and on the lake house. So in terms of best practices, what can we do when we are designing a, a workload such as this? So OCI is an extensive set of services and capabilities. And they are continuously being proved, improved. We launch new features very, very uh, quickly, typically on, on, a, on a monthly cycle. We also launched several new services throughout the year. So the idea here is use as needed, right? Each specific use case has a specific set of needs. So you don't need to use all the services, just adapt the services to the use cases that you need, the requirements that you need. Further on, if you augment that use case, if you bring new use cases, you can bring in new services, right? But you do not need to start right up front with a big data platform. You can basically grow as needed. Advice here is leverage serverless services as much as possible, right? What that means is you have less operational overhead in managing those services because you do not need to manage infrastructure, you do not need to manage the platform. It decreases your chances of success, it reduces risk, it also reduces probably your bill because typically those services are paper use, they are highly elastic, so you could basically use that elasticity to optimize cost. That is just, just good enough approach, right? Don't simplify, don't overcomplicate, right? Typically, start iterating. If you have a challenge, if you have, for instance, I have telemetry that is coming via streaming, I want to uh, basically provide some KPIs there, but I don't need to uh, do it in near real time. So probably sync that data, for instance, to cloud storage, start wrangling that data, put the KPIs on an autonomous data house, serve it with OEC. So use as needed, right? Further, you can basically augment that approach. Imagine on this use case, if you want to then start uh, processing data in real time, you can bring in stream analytics later on, and they will be complementary services. So in terms of data storage, we have this dichotomy of storing data in ADW, storing data in object storage, don't use a single approach, right? Decide based on the use case, what is the best data storage mechanism? Imagine you might want to store data, financial data on the lake house, highly sensitive data, imagine also HCM data, salary data, etc. Probably you want to have the extra security that a cloud data house, that autonomous data house would give you. Probably a good option would be storing that data in ADW. Imagine you might have telemetry that you want to store, 
large volumes of data coming from your senses. Imagine you're a utilities company, you basically have a lot of uh, smart readers and you want to basically ingest that data. Very important data, very uh, high volume of data, but probably in terms of KPIs, you are more interested not only on the readings, but also on the aggregation. So probably store the raw data on cloud storage, rank that data, create KPIs, and the minute you want to serve KPIs, aggregations, etc., probably move those aggregations to ADW. Why? Security, performance, and it's much, much more faster to consume data recurrently from the data house than it is from the object storage in terms of performance. Organize your lakehouse data, right? Don't turn that your lakehouse and your data platform into a data swamp. So basically a good enough approach and a very good approach actually is a medallion architecture. So stratify your data from bronze, silver, gold. Typically bronze will be almost like a staging area where you land the data. Typically land the data with your digital format. So imagine if it is a relational data, you're probably using the same format and the same semantics that you have on your data sources. When you move to silver, typically already conform your data to a typical dimensional model. And when you move to gold, typically gold is a result of aggregations, specific data products that are created with canonical data or with the data that was created on silver. Right? So the idea here is that when you move from silver, from bronze to silver to gold, you're actually increasing not only the governance, but also the security. Imagine a person that does ETL on bronze layer might not be able to get access to the gold layer, which is only the data products and KPIs that, for instance, the CFO can see if we're talking about financial data. For schema on rights, try to understand what data modeling works for you, right? We have different uh, modeling techniques from Snowflake, uh, from star schemas to data vaults. Typically, all of them have pros and cons. A traditional way of doing it, a star scheme is a very good option because it's widely supported by OCR services. It's also widely supported by the different technology that is used for data management. So good, a very good approach. If you have requirements beyond star schemas, think of what are the compromises and probably adopt a different data modeling technique. Leverage the data ingestion and processing engines that better support your requirements. Don't think that you always need, because of skill set eventually, or because of time to market, that you always need to use the same engine, right? We have different engines. So we have basically engines that uh, you could use to run Spark jobs, to do local ETL, whether that's on Spark, whether that's on database. So leverage the one that makes more sense for you for that specific use case, right? And don't rule out on a different use case using a different engine, as long as you basically organize, curate, and govern the data that is produced by those engines. So decoupling the processing and the engines from the storage. And don't use a single use case pattern, right, to address all challenges. Don't think that you always need to route data through cloud storage, for instance. Right? There might be good options or might be use cases where you really want to do that, but probably some other use cases you do not want to do that. So use as needed, right? idea here that I wanted to push is don't use the law of the hammer, uh, which basically states that if you have a problem and you have a hammer, every problem seems like a, a nail that you want to hit your hammer. Don't use that law of the hammer because what works on one case might not work on another. And you're basically overcomplicating the architecture by not acknowledging that. So one of the good advices that we can have is don't neglect the physical architecture, right? Obviously, the data platform, it's all about the data, but the underlying infrastructure, the underlying physical architecture is basically the conduit to store, move, and uh, process the data that you really need to have to basically produce your business outcomes. So all is designed for security, always, right? You do not want to have data breaches. Designed for high availability, you want your business to consume KPIs whenever they need, right? And that needs to be highly available. Luckily enough, in Oracle, we designed this by a standard, so it's quite easy to use high availability to design a data platform. Designed for resiliency and recovery according to your needs, right? All the services are resilient, but imagine you might have stringent requirements to have a DR, to basically understand how can you recover from a, 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 an outage, right? And whether you want to do that recovery on a single region with two regions, so don't take that into consideration, right? 
understand the trade-offs and also design to be scalable. Right? A good approach with, for instance, what is design depicted on, on the diagram here is a lake house that is serverless in nature so that basically once you want to scale out, scale in, all the services have those capabilities, it's quite easy to achieve that. All is designed with security in mind and place resources in private net networks, right? Idea, ideally here is that you want to use networking as a way to secure your workload and using private networks allows you to do that, right? And if you stratify and if you see the, the diagrams, which basically you can increase your security posture by segregating the different subnets, imagine the data is on a different private subnet compared to the meet here, compared to the analytics. Why? Because imagine you have, by some reason, you have a data breach. It's very quite, it's very, very easy to go to that subnet and basically lock down the security list, lock down the network security groups and make it quite easy to uh, lock down that, right? And it's very easy to respond to those types of events. So increase your security posture by using a good network design. Leverage these services built-in capabilities. So for instance, the more you leverage these services built-in capabilities for high availability, resilience, etc., the more value you get with less effort. So imagine Cloud Data House, Autonomous Data House, highly available by default, auto leverages basically, uh, depending on the configuration, leverages more than one node for resilience. It has automated backups. You could use autonomous data card to do basically recover, uh, recoverability and basically doing your, supporting your business continuity plan on the second region without too much effort, right? So the more you leverage those capabilities, the less effort you have, the more chance of success. Understand data volumes, right? At rest and in transits, you need to design for those data volumes. You need to understand the sizing of the solution, right? Because what might work for 100 gigs, 100 teras might not work for one petabyte, right? Be adamant of that, be uh, cognizant of that and design for uh, for those volumes. A good option in terms of OCI is that you can leverage the different services, ADW, BDS, Dataflow, for instance, have auto scaling. So you could basically design something that is scalable to volumes and basically very elastic. So you might have spikes and that elasticity that where you that where you need basically that elasticity to happen could be addressed by auto scaling. In the end, you're in control, right? Because in auto scaling, you could define roles of what is the maximum uh, cap capacity that you want to use for that auto scaling. Design data sources integration based on their availability. Imagine, don't expect the data sources to be always available for you to go there and pull the data source or do a micro batch. Imagine SaaS tools typically have, they throttle the requests, right? They don't want to be impacted by too many requests. So they will probably allow you to do X amount of requests on an hour, let's say. So add that in mind and design your data pipelines having into account that. And ideally leverage asynchronous integration to increase scalability and reduce single points of failure. For instance, leverage streaming, leverage events, leverage cloud events so that you do not have a single pipeline that goes from ingestion up to producing a data product that sits on the gold layer, but you have different discrete pipelines that are coordinated, almost choreographed with events so that you can basically have more resilience that you could understand which pipelines have run or not or failed on a specific area and you can have more manageability there. So don't, be, don't build a big monolith in terms of pipelining, build basically almost like micro pipelines to address specific portions of the chain in terms of ETL and we're producing uh, data and data products on the goals layer. Lakehouse workloads don't have to be complex, right? Typically you could start with something quite, quite easily and start your project there. But sometimes on large companies, they would become complex, right? OCI has the right tools to tame that complexity, right? On the diagram is very, very small, but uh, basically just to, to depict that point that on the left diagram, for instance, it's a lake house spread out through two regions with different environments. So prod environment, pre-prod environment, development, test, UAT. So you might, your company might need that, right? And basically keep in mind that in OCI, you can go from a very simple solution to a very complex solution, but you would have the capabilities and the features to make that, uh, that feasible to make that deployment feasible and the operations of that quite, quite uh, feasible as well. Proper design is key to address requirements, right? 
on a complex environment, this will even be more true. So consider leveraging the landing zone for increased security and management as well. More and more uh, companies are worried about data breaches, about segregation of duties. So use the landing zone, not only for the data platform workload, but as a whole to guarantee that you have a, a good stance and a good security posture. For mission critical workloads, we do advise obviously to use a second region for your business continuity. More and more data warehouses and lakes, lake houses were not seen as mission critical in the past. More and more they are seen as mission critical because typically if you want to be data driven, you need to basically have those results at the at, at, at the touch of a finger, right, on, on your application. If my CFO needs a KPI now, you cannot wait for one more hour. It needs to make that decision now. So probably if that workload fails, you would probably suffer because being data driven also means that you want to infuse intelligence in all transactional touch points. So consider a second region if you have those needs for business continuity. In terms of examples, where do you start from or where typically the majority of the customers start from? So imagine you might have already an existing data house. Most likely you have already an existing data house on-prem or elsewhere. And you want to improve and you want to improve. You want to eventually move if it is on-prem to cloud and you want to create new capacities, right? With a cloud data house such as autonomous data house, which is a very good choice. So you could modernize that uh, state to, to autonomous data house. We have a lot of capabilities to modern migrating data from other databases, other data houses or Oracle data houses into autonomous. You can basically extend those capabilities with new data sets, new types, external tables, JSON data, et cetera, you name it. You can basically start experimenting without friction with other capabilities, ML, AI, data science, et cetera. Optimize costs because being in cloud also means that you have auto scaling capabilities, scaling capabilities that you could reduce your baseline in terms of infrastructure consumption optimizing cost, but still having the security that whenever you need that capacity, you could scale, namely with auto scaling to address that. So imagine your data house typically has peaks around uh, in the morning after after lunch, when your users start basically seeing their KPIs, exploring their data, etc. You might use auto scaling to adjust the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure to the actual consumption needs and then optimize cost. And since we embed continuously OCI innovation, you also have the ability to continuously innovate with your workload. Modernize Hadoop workloads. You can have probably an existing Hadoop workload that you want to bring and modernize to clouds. We'll have basically, we have services that allow you to do that seamlessly, migrating that workload. Typically what most majority of companies do is they move those Hadoop workloads to clouds. They immediately get benefits from uh, uh, cloud infrastructure, from elasticity, from having a more managed service. And then typically what they do is they reassess the use cases, they start transforming more to a cloud native application or cloud native, cloud -native data platform, for instance, leveraging serverless Spark, engines, object storage, etc. Or you might want to build a new net cloud, a net new cloud lake house, for instance, which is mostly what we've been describing before in the next, on uh, the last couple of slides. And imagine the idea here is that you build it, you choose the right mix of services for the challenges or use cases that you have today. You start pragmatically, and then you can grow as needed, incorporating new use cases, new technology, new innovation. So in terms of like examples, these are real life examples from uh, engagements that we work on with, uh, with real life companies. For instance, this case is a data lake house. It's a, a lake house for a company that had several data silos and technologies. They had different lines of business, different subsidiaries, and they wanted to converge to a single governed interested data platform. Why? Because they did not have a central vision of all of their customers, of all of their operations, of all of their logistics, right? The idea here was that, and the issues that they had was data silos from those different subsidiaries, they had very inefficient acquisition uh, the data pipelines, whether of static data or streaming data. They had multiple versions of their master data because each subsidiary had that same customer represented differently, limited AI capabilities, and they had basically cloud first approach with uh, strict regulatory requirements. So this means that they needed to deploy on a private cloud, in our case, on a, something that they call dedicated region cloud customer 
that was deployed in their country. The solution proposed was basically a full lake house comprised not only of, in this case, big data service, our dupe service, because they already had uh, a legacy workload that they needed to move, but also the components, which you see more highlighted in green, that would allow them to start streaming data, start looking at data in, in batch, micro batch, transform data, store it on the lake house and serve initially data via analytics, via data services and via ML and AI. All of this governed, obviously. Nice interesting thing of this is this also showcases the how interoperable we can be, which is we uh, on this workload, the customers are also leveraging Informatica. And since we have a good partnership with Informatica, they could deploy Informatica IDMC on uh, on this topology and make sure that they leverage the uh, capabilities of Informatica and Informatica alongside the Oracle Data Lakehouse. Another example, Serverless Data Lakehouse, probably the one that you would probably choose for building a net new lakehouse or refactoring an existing lakehouse. This organization basically wanted to extract value out of their HR data. They had sensitive data such as uh, salaries, personnel uh, data, etc. So security was top of mind for them. What they needed to do is basically extract data from their different systems, store it on an analytical data platform securely, obviously storing that data securely, masking data, making sure that only users that were authorized to see that data will be able to see that data. And we have uh, dynamic data masking capabilities to do that. What they did basically was start ingesting data, store it on object storage. Actually, they staged data on object storage because the way it was mostly file-based ingestion. They use OCI data integration to start wrangling the data, store it in the autonomy data also that it could be served for users via analytics, like OAC, but also so that their users and data scientists could start experimenting with data science. Later on, they start augmenting a bit and doing uh, transformations at scale, also with data flow, leveraging that their Spark skills that they added in company. Data lake modernization, a good use case of an existing of a company that had an existing Hadoop workload. What they basically wanted to do is modernize that Hadoop workload. This workload was basically uh, addressing um, population movement. This was during the pandemic. They basically had a set of, they, they ran a, a region Wi-Fi spot, uh, Wi-Fi hotspot locations. And via those access points, they could get telemetry of how many people were hooked up to that access point, uh, how many people, and with that, they could basically understand crowd density, uh, understand places of interest, how many of them were visited, at which hour, and basically try to channel flow based on that so that they could control where population was and basically making sure that uh, they would not have issues on that region from a pandemic uh, outsurge in a sense. What they did was they bring in that um, that uh, existing Hadoop workload to big data service. They modernize it uh, immediately on clouds. So immediately cloud benefits from that scaling, scalability with big data service and managed service. So meaning patching, et cetera, is done automatically. But then they wanted also to augment the way they were serving data to their users. And in red, you basically see the extra um, services that were added in order to complement that Hadoop workload, that big data service workload. And with that, basically they were able to coexist the two, basically having the uh, big data service running uh, Kafka, Flume, Logstash, doing a lot of transformation with Spark, storing data with S3 Connect into object storage, which was then consumed by Autonomous Data House, and Autonomous Data House was used as a serving engine to serve analytic data to users via analytics cloud and also to data science via data science. It's quite an interesting use case. So in a nutshell, why the Oracle data platform? We went from what is the data platform? How does it fit? What workloads does it addresses? What are the best practices in addressing and designing those workloads? And I hope that you got that impression that in Oracle and with the data platform, you have a complete portfolio, right? We have from infrastructure to platform to software and industry solutions and having this ecosystem makes it quite easy and secure to get data from the different components. It is secure by design. So we basically build security from the ground up. So we have a zero trust 
approach, uh, uh, security approach to, to anything that we do in OCI, including the data platforms. So that makes it very compelling, obviously, in address, for instance, uh, or avoiding and mitigating the risks of data breaches. Right choice of deployment, so we meet where you are. You could basically deploy on a region of uh, that Oracle has with, with, with a public cloud, whether that's in, in Europe, JPEG, LADS, North, North America, you name it. But you could also deploy it on Cloud App Customer, at your own data center, or eventually if you want, on-prem portions of it as well. Autonomous platforms. This is our basically marquee service, Autonomous Data House for the data platform, uses autonomous data platforms, and basically is a self-running platform that basically maintains itself, patches itself, optimizes itself, meaning you extract much more value out of your data with Autonomous Data House without the burden to manage it, to basically optimize it because the service does it for you, fully managed service. Comprehensive and modular and open in the sense that you can address all types of use cases from analytics to ML, et cetera, but you could do it on a modular way, use as needed, use the services as needed, interoperate with other technologies, run open source on, on OCI as well, on the data platform. So it's flexible in terms of choice. That's price performance. So we have basically a good pricing for all of the services that I've mentioned, for storing data, for egress of data, and that makes a big difference when it comes to cloud economics. And we also back all of this with comprehensive SLA so that we make sure that your data platform runs all the time. It has built-in high availability, resilience, and we back that with SLAs. So this was the session that I wanted to, to uh, show you. Hope you find it interesting. Hope that you embark on a journey to design data platforms with us. If you want to have a copy of this slide deck, engage with us. If you want to discuss more, engage with us and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much and see you next time.